Hello, welcome to Wealth Talk episode 18. My name is Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, and I am joined this week by Mr. Kevin Whelan, founder. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm doing very well, Chris, and uh, again, I'm a bit remote from you today. Yeah, I so, know. Uh, hoping the... Uh, Hoping all the tech works and the, uh, the quality is good for, for both sides. Yeah, well, we had lots of good feedback from last week's episode, which was Wealth Talk 17. And we were looking last week at this incredible amount of money that seems to be floating around out there, which is the lost pension money. And we heard from three of our members who, between them, had rediscovered £400,000 worth that they really had just kind of, you know, dismissed almost and just, just with very little effort... And uh, we heard the different ways of going about that had managed to trace that lost pension money. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating as you as you think about the obstacle that people put in the way that this feels like too big a job or who do I contact or how hard would this be? But if you look at the hourly rate that was achieved by each of those, you know, maybe no more than an hour spent by each. And one made 45 grand an hour, the other one made 100 grand an hour and and, and Chris made 250 grand an hour. I mean, I don't know about you, Chris, but that's a pretty healthy return on investment. It sure is, yeah. You know, yeah. and that's just three people who were proximate, you know. It's not like three people in a year. This is three people in a week. Mm. Um, so we'd love to hear that somebody else did that. And maybe maybe the, what we can do, Chris, is just think about um, putting together, even if it's just a little checklist, you know, where or suggest even now that people just uh, almost like a CV, you know, write down their national insurance number so they, they know where that is. It's not difficult to find. It's on your pay slip or your P60 or it's on your tax return if you're self-employed. Um, and then just list from education onwards to where you are now, you know, who did I work for? And, you know, just cross-check. Did I have a pension? You know, if, if, even if you're not sure, just give them a call, you know, and see if be like a, a kid on that journey of discovery you know, just to find a little treasure chest. Um, you know, like my, <laughs> I remember when my son was younger, he was always out chasing Pokemon, you know, well, let's go out and chase pensions and <laughs> have, have a bit of fun with it and see if people can't tell us, hey, you know what, I took your advice and I found 10 grand. 10 grand is incredible. Yeah. You know, oh, look, okay, these three were much larger than that, but uh, but 10,000 quid is is, you know, not an unhealthy return for an hour's worth of time. So, you know, I'd do that every day of the week, even though I don't normally like to trade time for money, I'd do that one. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I think for anyone listening to, to share the message with others, I was out having dinner with some friends during the week and, you know, just mentioned this and uh, my friend was like, I'm absolutely going to do that. You know, there's definitely a couple of old employers that I need to track down. So, yeah, share the message because, you know, we actually talked about a figure of 10 billion last week, but with a little bit more research this week, we've seen that that figure actually could be nearer 20 billion, which is, you know, there's a lot of people's money out there that needs to be reclaimed. Yeah. And I think the other half actually, because the, you have to look at the source of the information and the source of the 10 billion was, I think, uh, all to do with insurers. So that's money in insurance company funds. But remember, uh, as I explained in the pension you know, podcast, the initial one, there, there are two main sources, aren't there? There's kind of money in pots, that's insurance companies typically, and then there's money in benefits, which is related to years of service and a job. And you know, nobody counted that because the insurers have no way of doing that. But I think um, another organization you know, counted that and said, hey, it could be 20 billion, you know, so... Mm. So whether it's money in a pot, whether it's a few years of service that you've just forgotten about, just, you know, take the time and just find out and let us know. And uh, don't forget, Chris, if you had dinner with someone, press them again and say, hey, how did you get on? Mm -hmm. you know, it's always good to, to nudge people. And that's all part of the benefit, I think, of why Wealth Builders is a community, isn't it? We buddy people up and try and help, uh, help them nudge each other to get things done because it's easy to put things off when life gets in the way. Yeah, indeed. I think it's just worth mentioning as well for anyone listening who, who maybe has just picked up on the Wealth Talk podcast, you know, in the last few weeks and hopefully enjoying listening to, uh, to us discuss, you know, these different areas. But I would definitely recommend going back and, and listening to some of the earlier episodes because everything we've come to now, Kevin, is, is really centered around the seven pillars of wealth. And we kind of laid the foundation for that in the earlier episodes. And, and what we're doing now over the next few weeks is actually going through each of these seven pillars individually. 
And we started with pillar one a couple of weeks ago, which was home capacity. Mm. And obviously last week we started on pillar two, which was pensions. And today we're, we're sticking with pensions because anyone who heard last week's interviews would have heard this term SAS being mentioned. And when we say SAS, we're talking S-S-A-S. Would you like to explain a little bit more about what exactly a SAS pension is, Kevin? Yeah, so, so you know, as I said before, whenever you're on a journey to create wealth, there is always going to be some new language. And, and that's true of the principles of wealth building, are like ROIs, for example, and we've touched on that many, many times now, and the different ROIs. And also, when you get into each individual pillar, whether it's property or pensions or investments or business or IP or you know um, joint ventures, there's always a new piece of language. So, so it's always important to stop and learn the language just to make sure you embed that and you don't feel overwhelmed by it. So SAS isn't complicated. It's just an awkward title. So it's not SAS. It's not, you know, the armed forces in a, in a curious way. It's not software as a service, S-A-A-S. But it does actually um, link to the, the thought of a subscription model because it's a way to create recurring income for yourself. So just as S-A-A-S is subscription-based software, this is a subscription-based pension where you can generate high levels of recurring income. In short, small self-administered scheme is a very small piece of the pensions landscape, which is broken down, as I've said earlier on, if you think about it, is, you know, on one side of the coin, we've got the big insurance company pensions, you know, the, all of the, the big organizations who manage money. On the other side of the coin, you can imagine flipping a coin. On the other side... So heads is the insurers, tails is the uh, big, uh, the big um, employers, you know, and I mentioned loads of those who've had final salary pension schemes in the past. And, and uh, I think we mentioned Marks and Spencers and Tesco's and all sorts of different organizations. And uh, there's lots of them around. And, but if by chance the coin landed on its edge, and that very slim edge that represents the balance between the two is something which is known as a member-directed scheme. In other words, instead of being relying on your employer, instead of relying on an insurer, you take responsibility for self. So it's no surprise that self-administered scheme, or small self-administered scheme, I'll come back to that in a second, is about self. Now, this isn't about being an insurance company or being an employer it's about being responsible for money which you can now do something with and that money small service scheme means small means less than 12 people in other words it's designed to be operated by people and families and small businesses it's not meant to be the massive schemes that you'll see you know, where there's thousands and thousands and thousands of members. It's meant to be managed and controlled in that way. So that's small. Self means you. Now, so in an insurance company, you know, it's the insurer who's responsible. They legally are the owner of the scheme because uh, a trust, which is pension, is always written under rules of trust, and there's some benefits of that, which I guess I'll come on to during the course of this session on pensions. But one of the huge benefits of trust is tax-free. And it's inheritance tax-free, income tax-free, corporation tax-free, capital gains tax-free. I don't know if there are any more taxes, Chris, but that's, you know, pretty tax-free. So it's a tax-free trust fund run by yourself or up to 11 people. So you can buy a big family together or a small business together. And scheme is just another word in law for pension. So small self-administered scheme means a pension plan run by the people who own it they take control and then they invest that money in the way that they think reflects their wealth dynamic reflects their past experience reflects the future direction of where they want to go and is a real incredible opportunity as i'm sure you'll hear from uh, the three um, participants today you know who shared their knowledge and their experiences chris they will have all learned something that they didn't know before. And this is a really key thing about how the SAS pension can work. It can facilitate your 
personal growth and an increase in your personal ROI, that's a return on your intellect, you become a smarter investor. It increases your financial ROI, your return on investment. And because you're building this, and it's a trust fund, it never ends. So it means you can pass that on to the next generation and the one after that and the one after that. So you're building a, a almost like a, um, a wisdom inside the SAS as you learn more and do more. And then you can invite your children and family members in from age 18. You have to be 18 to be a trustee. That's the technical definition of somebody who runs a scheme as a trustee. And while it all sounds quite complicated, it isn't. It's teachable. It's manageable for people who are serious about building their wealth because wealth is a business. Even in your mind, building wealth is like a business and a SaaS is a pension scheme that's run just like a business. And, you know, a business has a board of directors. A SaaS is a board of trustees. That's the same. A business makes profit on which it pays tax. A SaaS makes profit, but it's tax-free, as I mentioned, so that's pretty whizzy. And, you know, a, a pension or a company has to report to the inland revenue every year of what they're doing. Um, and that has to happen in a SAS. It's an annual reporting system. Of course, all these things are done. There's, there are people like us and, uh, and others who provide that support and that education and that training to make this highly, highly possible and interesting and pleasurable for people to get involved in. But anyway, I could wax on about SASs all day long because I love them. You know, I'm a SAS trustee myself and my wife, and I've got, you know, three kids who are all grown up now. So, you know, I'm slowly but surely bringing them into the, the long-term plan. And and I think maybe we'll touch on that on another podcast, Chris, how we've people have brought their kids in. Maybe that's a, a realization yeah. that would be fascinating. Can you imagine you know, somebody bringing their kids into a pension plan with an insurance company or their old employer, that just simply would not happen. Yeah, it, it all links into one of the, the Wealth Builder values about passing on a fantastic legacy, doesn't it? Along with the wisdom that you accumulated mm. along the way. So you pass on not just money, you pass on wisdom. But but enough of that. Why don't we hear from some of the people who have experienced this for themselves? So it's not just me, it's real other people, uh, all with different levels of experience and all with different levels of um, where they started. But what's true of all of them, I think, is they were all employed people. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, and then became wealth building business owners. Uh, and of course, all of them in, in the long term are now business owners, uh, but they didn't necessarily start off as business owners. Their wealth took them in that direction. And um, it would be great to hear from them and maybe just debrief on some of the key lessons um, after that. Absolutely. So we've got three members of the Wealth Builders community here and three different ways in which they've utilised the funds from their SaaS. And let's head on over and listen to those right now. Okay, so I'm with Chris Henry. Welcome to Wealth Talk, Chris. Hi, Christine. How are you doing? Very, very well, thank you. Now, we're talking today about SaaS pensions and the different ways in which the funds can be used. Now, I know you've used your pension to lend to other people. So would you mind telling us a bit more about how you've gone about that? Absolutely, Christian. Uh, and hopefully you'll feel some of the passion coming through my voice as I'm talking about this, because um, SaaS has been a complete game changer for tracing myself and my family. So I, I really enjoy sharing the story you've been through. So if I just tell you a little, can I give you a bit of background, if that's all right to me? My background is uh, is accounting and, and finance, so I do like the number side of life, but I also like people. Um, and I found out about SAS through Kevin Whelan and Wealth Builders. Um, as an accountant working for a bank, I'd got no concept of what was actually possible with my final salary pension scheme. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I was the, I was the person that used to grab the, grab the statement look at it and bung it in the drawer and uh, you know it's it's with the power of knowledge is quite incredible I think which you can have uh, establish exactly what you can do with a final salary pension so so I kept going into contact through um, a company called well Action Coach is a franchise that I bought uh, the franchise for um, and I wanted to find a way of actually acquiring the franchise quite a hefty investment using my pension 
and that was where the connection came with with Kevin. So, and, and that's where the journey started, really. I think quite cautious, but Kevin taught me how I could acquire the franchise using my pension. Um, and over a period of probably twelve months, uh, it took me to really get to understand what the answer to the possible was. Both myself, Tracy, and my wife moved our pensions out into what is now our own SaaS. So, that that's that's kind of where the interface with SaaS started. Um, and that, this was kind of four years ago, August two thousand and fifteen. We we established our SaaS and transferred in, and it's been a an amazing journey since then. But and you know, just to to, to the question, Christian, where we started really was um, was by lending. Um, again, didn't appreciate once you got your pension out, you could lend it. Um, quite ironic that um, I left a bank and uh, and became a bank. I think I think the customer service in my bank is a lot better than it was uh, with the one I left. But uh, yeah, so again, being guided by Kevin, and it, it starts with education, um, being educated on what you can do. Um, and in a very controlled manner, we started to lend our funds out. And I think it's important um, to have a, a policy to follow um, to make sure you kind of protect yourself because it all, this is all about legacy for us. It's about passing on our, our, our assets to our kids and having a clear set of criteria, which is what we had, was where we started. So if I just run through those very quickly, um, we started off really just being interest, interested in property only wanted to lend on property. I like the idea of, of being able to touch what I'm lending against uh, and the security of property for me is, uh, is quite valuable. So property was a strategy. Um, and what, what Kevin has got around him is a, an amazing community of people that have got varying levels of expertise. And we wanted to tell it to lend to people that were experts in property so that have got a track record. I think that's the power of the community that Kevin's got. Uh, a lot of people that have been through very strict due diligence. Uh, so you know you're dealing with uh, people that have got uh, integrity and credibility. And that, for me, is a, is, a, is a protection for us. That's the first layer of protection. Who are you dealing with? And, and that, for me, is the crucial part of, of, of the process. So lending against property. Um, so these are developers that are looking for funds um, on, on, the, on their developments. Um, we would generally take a first charge against their property. That's our policy. Um, again, all this is trying to protect yourself. Um, only ever lending... Um, no more than 75% of the valuation of their property, their development. So we take a valuation out on their development to make sure we kind of, there was headroom um, when we were lending uh, and getting good returns, you know, getting good returns against, against the, uh, against the, uh, for, for our SAS and for our pension and for our future. So I, th- I think that, that that's, that's kind of where we started. Um, now two or three of the uh, deals we did with people um, on average, people ask me on average, how much did you lend? And, um, Generally, it was uh, between fifty and one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. That's what we were lending out uh, to people. Um, did about eight eight lending deals. Two of those were uh, what we call lend and learn. Um, now, lend and learn is where you're lending money and you're trading a, a little bit of interest for quite a lot of knowledge. So you would you would lend at a lower rate, but you get the the benefit of going out to see a development, going out to spend time with the people that are experts in a particular strategy and. So there's a win for them and there's, there's a win for us. Um, now, Tracy and myself set off um, with a plan to learn property, not realising that you can actually be, have property um, without learning it. You can be an armchair investor. And once we learn, again, through Kevin, that you can do that, um, we kind of decided we were going to be armchair investors. Um, and that's the way it's panned out. So we've got a passive income now that comes through property. Um, and I haven't met any, any of our tenants. We've got five HMOs at the moment, 30, 30 units, 30 rooms. So that, that, that's kind of where that's where we've got to. And that, that's how it all started. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So many lessons there wrapped up in in one. And I like the way, yeah. obviously, that it enabled the pension allowed you to actually purchase the business franchise as well, which you know another Absolutely. benefit that people just I'm sure would never Absolutely. consider that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Thanks so much. And I think you've really displayed there many of the wealth builders' values in terms of really taking proactive, responsible, hands on approach. You know, for your financial future there, and you know wanting to pass on a fantastic legacy as well through through the work that you're doing absolutely yeah thanks so much for sharing that story today with us chris no problem christian so i'm with paul watson welcome to wealth talk paul thank you very much 
So we're talking today about SaaS pensions and the different ways in which the funds can be used. Now, you've used your pension to do something which we call a loan back. So would you mind telling our listeners a little bit about that, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so a bit of background on, on me. I am uh, already in property. So I run a portfolio of, uh, uh, of HMOs, Houses of Multiple Occupation. Uh, we already had four up and running and we were in the process of working out the funding for our fifth property. Um, having come from a corporate background i had my company pension and through my introductions to wealth builders uh, that was obviously transferred from a corporate pension into a SaaS pension that along with advice from wealth builders uh, I, I'm managing with my wife and having done a number of different just sort of standard investments we were obviously introduced to the concept of a loan back um, and the idea of being able to borrow a chunk of money from the pension certainly worked for us for this next property. Um, with the acquisition of that property, obviously you can't hold a, a, a residential property in your SaaS. So it's very clear that we couldn't use funds to buy the property, but that was okay because we had working capital. But the acquisition of the property meant that we used up all of our working capital. So we didn't have funds to do the extension to the property that we wanted to do or the refurbishment work. Um, and what our plans were for this property were quite chunky. So we were looking at something uh, just over a couple of hundred thousand pounds pounds. Um, now, luckily in the SAS, there was sufficient funds for that. So we were able to borrow just a little over 220,000. Um, obviously, the rules are that you can loan back up to 50% of your SAS. Uh, so we were sort of getting up towards that mark, but, but uh, we were able to borrow 220,000. That went from the SAS pension to our sponsoring company, which was the property operating company, effectively. And then we were able to use that money to do a large uh, extension to the property and a, a major refurbishment of, of the whole property. Um, under the normal rules of a loan back, uh, you borrow the money at 1% uh, at above sort of Bank of England uh, rate. Uh, and at the time that we took it out, the, the interest rate uh, was only a quarter percent. It's obviously gone up a little bit since then, but it was a quarter percent. So from my point of view, to be able to borrow money uh, at one and a quarter percent was a was a great opportunity. Um, one of the other key rules on a loan back is that uh, the principal loan needs to be paid back over typically a period of a maximum of five years with the capital going back at sort of 20 percent a year. Um, in this particular case, uh, our initial intention was to to manage the whole of the refurb project within a 12 month time frame. That was certainly the going in uh, intention. However, um, our friends at the planning world, uh, and I'm sure you have property people out there listening, will be familiar with the planning world, never quite goes according to plan. So actually the overall timeline of the refurbishment dribbled over the 12 months and, and, and ran to about 15 months. So what that meant was that we had to obviously find uh, some funds which we were able to do to pay back 20% of that uh, initial capital lump sum. So a little over 40,000, about 45,000 I think we paid back. Um, that was fine. We had we had sufficient funds to to do that, so we paid that that back into the pension, and then at the point where the refurb was finished, which was around about fifteen to sixteen months after the uh, project had begun, we refinanced the house, remortgaged it. Obviously, had a, a significant valuation uplift. We were able to pull out all of the refurb funds uh, back out of the property, and then we repaid that back into to the pension. Um, so that was kind of what happened overall. Now, obviously, some of the key points in there are um, the you know being able to borrow up to fifty percent of your 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 SaaS amount. One of the key things that's required when you do something like that is um, the the security side of things. And through conversations with wealth builders, learning from them, advice from them, there were two key elements. One is that um, we needed to have a security trustee clause in the loan agreement. So that was obviously put in place. Um, and then the other part of it was just, you know, what was I going to be using as security for that loan? Now, for everybody that's doing SaaS loan backs, it'll be a different amount uh, and it'll be different elements of security that they need to put against that, that loan. In my particular case, um, 
my my father and I jointly owned the property that he and, and my mum were, you know, happily married in for goodness knows how many years. When my mum passed away, that property came or her half of the property came to me. So I'm on the title deeds. Uh, that property is unencumbered. And so I've been able to use that property as the security against the, the loan that I took out from my pension. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview as to what we what we did, how much we borrowed, what it was used for, uh, and the sort of time frames. Yeah, that's a fantastic example. Thank you very much for sharing that with us today, Paul. So I'm with Mark Stokes. Welcome to Wealth Talk, Mark. Thank you very much, Christian. How are you? Yeah, excellent today. Thank you. Now, Mark, you've used your pension to enable you to focus on commercial property. Would you mind giving our listeners a bit more of an understanding around how you've been able to achieve this? Yeah, brilliant. And and first of all, thank you for inviting me on to your excellent podcast, Wealth Talk. Um, so I retired about four years ago uh, from 26 years of corporate life. And in, as part of taking control of my personal economy, we created a SaaS very quickly. So we've had one for nearly four years now. And given my background in real estate and, and, and construction and infrastructure, commercial property was right up there front and center. Um, for one of our acquisition and investment strategies. My background has always been about bank grade due diligence, and that was a natural uh, momentum and inertia from corporate life. And we were able to apply that and continue to apply that to commercial property uh, development and long-term hold investment decisions. Uh, In fact, I actually wrote a book on exactly that subject, commercial to residential conversions. Um, Now, with our SaaS in particular, our um, our SaaS acquired very quickly a a lovely five-story Edwardian uh, uh, terrace block, which um, was used for um, commercial property. And we acquired that and worked very hard on it for um, quite some months and achieved a, a planning gain and subsequently sold that out um for for later development by others so that was one particular example christian of where we created you know catalytic value within the SaaS, um which which was wonderful so there's there's just one example and uh would you like to hear some more yes please do um so we um our echo group business we do a lot of commercial to residential conversions and many of our investors in that scheme uh, in, in each development may come from private high net worth or, or, or from SaaS trustees. So that's another area where we use uh, SaaS to enable others, um, you know, learning and, and advancing. Um, so it's about creating shared value. Now, one particular um, uh, commercial acquisition um, we acquired was was only last September, and we're literally finishing it now. We're, we're now recording this in, in late May 2019, um, and in nine months, we've created the acquisition of, of five commercial properties, all side by side in, in one, uh, one cluster. Um, we've acquired planning permission uh, to convert the uppers into three residential property. And through a little bit, a little bit of structuring, not too sophisticated, we've been able to create five commercial properties with brand new um uh, fully repair and insure leases for so we have tenants in for between 10 and 18 years and we offset that to our managing agent and literally that will be a long-term hold for us and with the planning permission we're selling those uppers uh, which will become three apartments and they'll all be complete by mid-june and they will be held outside of our SAS. so we're ma- maintaining compliance and governance at all times so that will create us a combined £75,000 a year forever income stream. Um, and that's on a conservative level. But what I find really fascinating, Christian, is I reflect quite a lot and, and utilise the skills over many years. And on that particular opportunity, I calculated out my personal contributions and returns in my pension over 26 years of corporate life have now been doubled, the equivalent doubled by that one transaction in nine months. So approximately half a million of forced equity into that one development equates to all of my 25 years of pension contributions and the returns. And I find that absolutely staggering. And if if that isn't the, the catalytic power 
of SAS live in action, then I don't know what is. It's just wonderful. No, that is quite incredible and, and very inspiring indeed, Mark. And um, in what way has Wealth Builders helped you along some of that journey, Mark? Well, a number of ways, actually. Um, I first met Kevin uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we already had our SAS, um, but we we probably wanted to increase the uh, the engagement level with our with our corporate trustee. So Wealth Builders became our corporate trustee. We did a takeover process. Uh, Kevin and Lars and the team they came in uh, and have supported us nobly as, as we're really turning up the heat under our SaaS and enabling our, our personal economy. So that's one particular area. And then, of course, Wealth Builders and my organization, SaaS Alliance, we're strategic partners together. So we're spreading the great word of SaaS pensions, but also how to engage with SAS pensions in a responsible manner. We both share that understanding, that duty of care and the due diligence. So we work side by side, uh, hand in glove, and it is just wonderful working with with so many SAS trustees who are wealth builder uh, SAS members as well as uh, SAS Alliance members. So many different ways, shapes and forms, and it's a wonderful relationship. Yeah, it certainly is. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story today on Wealth Talk, Mark. No problem. Anytime, Christian. Okay, so three very different examples there of how the SaaS has been used, Kevin. Shall we, shall we start with Chris with the Lend and Learn strategy there? Yeah, I mean, the thing to note about Chris is, you know, Chris was a banker and an accountant. So what does that give you an impression of? Caution, uh, diligence, you know, a solid approach to things. Now. I don't know if Chris, you know, would, <laughs> I'm sure it'd be okay for me to mention that him and his wife took, you know, a good 12 months to make their mind up. And, you know, quite rightly, they wanted to really think it through and that's fine. There's no hurry into SAS. The SAS is for life once you make that decision. And now, <clears throat> if Chris is a banker, what was logical for him was to see the money that he accepted into uh, his SAS basically as a large cash lump sum that came in, he became a bank. And why wouldn't he bring the knowledge of the banking industry with all of the risk mitigation measures they have in play and simply build his wealth by doing exactly what a bank did? You know, so being a banker, becoming a bank makes absolute sense because you're not learning everything from scratch. It's not like you had to learn loads. He'd already brought decades of experience and just made his pension be a reflection of who he was in the past. But as you saw from his lending and learning, he wanted to build an additional skill in addition to that. And that connection came from within the wealth builder community, a brilliant guy up in in the Northeast, in fact. And, um, you know, and we're delighted that that connection has worked for both things. But also, you know, Chris, um, when he moved on from banking, he became a business coach. And now he's so excited about what he's been doing in his SaaS. He's, you know, you can't hold him back, really, if you meet Chris. It's almost like he's becoming part of the wealth coaching process now. You know, he can't stop telling other people about what to do. So you can see that although Chris has dramatically, and if you saw the numbers, dramatically changed his life around, massive pension compared to what he would have had before, access to the money much earlier than the normal retirement date of his banking scheme. And the opportunity to build a business, the opportunity to build a new business in property, but also to build on the strengths and the foundations you already had locked in place. So Chris is a brilliant example of why SaaS can be right when people take their time. He did take careful advice, proper financial advice. And we need to keep saying that, Chris, that while we're giving stories of what people have done, they're always, always, always are looking to make sure that they've taken professional advice before they finally make their own mind up. Mm. And whilst our three guests there all talked about property, you know, we must emphasize that the SaaS can be used for other things, not just property. Yeah, I mean, I think it's relevant that in the UK, I think we have a love affair with property and it's, it's logical. But Chris expanded his coaching business, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's not a bad thing to do as well. So that's, you know, that's a genuine business. And uh, it might be, you know, useful to, you know, catch up with what Paul Paul was up to. Yeah, 
Paul did the loan back. So you mentioned there, you know, he had the funds to, to purchase the property, but then would have been out of funds to do all the works that he needed. So he took up to 50% of his, his pension pot, his SAS, which, which uh, obviously is the law there. And, um, and that allowed him then to, uh, to obviously accelerate that and uh, make a good return. And there were some good lessons there from Paul's, Paul's story. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the point is that there's, um, there's an assumption that many people make that somehow pensions and property are simply not possible to combine, like oil and water. But if you use the, the appropriate rule of law, and the lung back is a method of doing that, there are rules and regulations, and we won't go into the details of those, but they're not that difficult to learn, and, and Paul learned them. In fact, you know, we have a training module specifically for that. But let's just think about that. So he accessed money for property, which he owns outside of the pension, and he paid an interest rate back to himself, which he grew inside the pension. Um, so in a sense, then, what Paul's been able to do is build wealth in his pension and out of his pension. But he had control of that. He had control of the choice. Is there any other pension that allows that to happen? I don't think so, because there is no access to any pension at all. No personal pension, no occupational pension will allow an individual access. Now, you've got to have a company, and obviously Paul has a limited company where he was buying and developing property, but also he got access to those funds at very low cost. So cheaper than, you know, being able to get access to that, say, in a conventional mortgage. And if we remember Pillar 1, when Carol had uh, taken money from the equity in her home, bought a, a property she couldn't have got because she couldn't have got a mortgage on it and then simply paid herself back. This is exactly the same thing, except the capacity that's being accessed here by Paul was inside of his pension, not inside of the piece of property. But you see how the principles are the same. You know, it's leveraging one asset and using it in another and understanding how you manage the risk. But either way, you know, what it's done is given Chris and um, given Paul rather an incredible leverage return on money that uh, had he left it where it was would have simply not performed at the same level. Mm. So he's, he's winning both ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we we've talked on previous episode, haven't we, about creating value, wealth flows to value and, and all of these, you know, have used their their backgrounds, their their knowledge, their skills in the areas that they they understood, and they were able to obviously then deliver value through the SaaS, and none more so really than Mark Stokes there, who has that commercial understanding, and so it made perfect sense to to obviously focus on those kind of projects with his SaaS. Well, absolutely, and you know, you know, Mark has got a an incredible commercial background, and uh, he was a true collaborator as you'll know from his SAS he's got there are four people in the SAS so you know he comes at it from the point of view of always looking for ways to find shared value always looking for ways to collaborate ethically and in the same way you know he's able to facilitate the use of this this money owned by four people right so normally can you combine four pensions together no you can't you can't get four employees working for a big company, put their money together, or four people with insurance company pots. You can't do that. You can do that in SaaS. It's a true tool of collaboration. And again, him and his, his, his business partners are, are holding assets both inside and outside of their pension, but it's the pension that's facilitated that. And, you know, although Mark has got a significant more knowledge, I suppose, than where Chris started and where Paul started in the type of projects, which is more the sort of commercial conversions into residential units. Uh, again, special rules apply for, for that. But nonetheless, if the use of that money can turn one deal into a half a million pounds worth of equity, and that's just one deal, how big an impact on that from an ROI perspective is that? I mean, that's life-changing for many people, you know. So as I've said before, Chris, the ROI that these guys are now seeking because they're in control of that money, instead of it being off their radar, instead of it being in a pot that's do not disturb till 65, they're bringing it to life every single day in their businesses. And therefore, they can be seeking that magic ROI, that one relationship, that one opportunity, that one idea. And each one of them has done that. 
So with, with Chris, he found a relationship. With Paul, he found his own opportunity and Mark found his own opportunity. So they're not creating new ideas. There's no IP being created here, but he's there. Now, Mark was so impressed with what he's done, how he's done it, he's gone on and written a book. Yeah. Now, how often does that happen? <laughs> I can't remember anybody writing a book about my personal pension, you know? So no, he's written a book about it and so impressed with he, uh, about what he's done. He's created IP. So and now I think that book is selling so well on Amazon and he's able to teach this. So not if, if he wants for business, but also because he's just a great collaborator and a great sharer. So, you know, he's enjoying it. You know, and did he enjoy the money in his pension? No, I think <laughs> I remember him saying, you know, all I did was my strategy was I just read the pension statement once a year and hoped it would do better next year. Now look at it. It's a completely different relationship. Um, and as his kids are growing up, I absolutely know that what they're trying to do with their families is bring the, the kids slowly in so that they become part of the, the legacy plan, which is an important very, very important part, actually, for, for all three um, of our contributors today. So I'd like to thank them for the contribution and the lessons that we've been, been able to bring out of that. But these are three out of, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So it would be definitely good to see what other people have done other than property, but to give a, a real good summary of how three people from different backgrounds have used their money to help their business and build more property. Wow, I mean, that's a success story, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. And I think just to clarify, Kevin, because I'm not sure we've actually touched on it in this episode, for someone listening who, you know, this is kind of new information. They're thinking about the, the age limits that often apply with pensions. Just to clarify here, with a SAS, are there any age limits or what are the age limits, I should ask? Uh, 18. <laughs> That's it. You know, all you need to do is, is, is be 18. Um, you know, obviously, most of our clients are not 18. They're, they're 30s, 40s and 50s, right? So, you know, so there's no age limit. You have to be a business owner. And uh, as long as you take good, careful advice and you know what you're doing and you have a good plan, then you can bring pensions from old world, you know, part of your history and bring them into a SaaS to be a part of your future. And this is what you can do. And, and, and all they need to do, if anybody's curious about that, is check out the resources, you know, slowly, slowly take a, a leaf out of Chris's book, you know, take time, uh, learn the lessons, make connections, find out who's done things, you know, really get to grips with, um, is it you? It's not for everybody, right? It can't be for everybody because you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to be willing to take responsibility, willing to get involved, willing to be a person who adds value. If you're not willing to do those things, the SaaS is the wrong thing to be considering, you know? Uh, then in, in a way, most people who don't really bring any value don't really bring any wealth to themselves and they end up relying on that home equity and downsizing too late and a bit of pension where they have to manage the uncertainty of how it all converts into income in the future and stock market volatility and the same thing with investments. So it's a pretty difficult place. So for those people who we meet with and, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a month, uh, you know, are telling us they want to build their wealth and they're willing to take that responsibility, you know, have a look at some of the people doing that and learning lessons on our Facebook group. Um, just take your time and explore it because, you know, it's that one or one ROI, you know, seek that one idea. This might be an idea for you. If you've never heard of it, just explore it. And if you resonate with, with us at Wealth Builders, we'd love to help you. If you resonate with somebody else, get help from somebody else, but either way, just take time to explore it. Mm. And, and maybe to make it even easier, um, why don't I put just a link together for someone who is listening right now and, and thinks this, you know, could be something to explore further. So I'll put a, just a simple form for anyone who wants to just make an inquiry and just see, you know, if they are eligible perhaps for, for SAS. Um, so that, why don't I do the link wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash SAS eligibility. So that'd be S-S-A-S eligibility and um anyone listening right now you can just pop along to that and and uh and then get in touch with one of our team yeah sure 
So I hope that's uh, good lessons learned uh, for for this week's um, podcast, Chris. Um, maybe we're still not done with pensions yet, so we'll need to have a think about what we'll do the next one because it's it is the biggest topic of all because it's where most people in the UK, you know, are building their their future wealth upon. Really, so we need to you know, do it justice before we move on. No problem. Well, we'll round things off in next week's wealth talk. Thanks again, Kevin, for today. You're welcome, Chris. As always. See ya.